Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Hi, and welcome to Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. On this week's episode of Common Ground, we join Al Fritz of Laporte, who shows us his collection of pottery and use of natural elements, which he incorporates into his finished pieces. My name is Alan Fritz. I enjoy clay, and I always have since uh, being in school. And I like clay for many reasons. It's a natural thing, and it's very flexible, and it's something you can work with whether you're seven or whether you're 70. And you can have fun with it, or you can be serious with it. You can make something that you enjoy, or you can uh, make something that you can use. And so I enjoy clay, I always have, and uh, it's, it's what I enjoy working with. For some reason, I've always liked bowls. And so I make small bowls, and I like to add to that by having wood lids that I put on top of the bowl. I turn that and I sand it and for the stem or the handle that you would pick up we actually go out into the woods and find pieces of stems of trees and we cut that so it's a very organic, it's a very natural and it's a, just a very simple looking piece. And then I also make uh, some other small things. And just recently, we've started making and selling around the country uh, a lamp that has a ceramic base. And the top for a shade has either mica or copper. Uh, well, here's a few examples of some things you can do with clay. And I just want to say that anybody can work with clay. It's whether, you, like I said, whether you're seven or whether you're 70, clay is really for anyone and everyone. And I think, uh, I think a lot of people really deep down inside just would like to just get their hands into some clay. So I enjoy it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a couple directions that a person can take. Um, here's a simple bowl and uh, I enjoy organic shapes. Um, I like to have organic, random organic shapes and designs. And so this is a, just kind of a very low profile bowl and uh, this has been glaze fired actually three times and multiple glaze firing is something that most potters do not do. So as far as something that might make this a little different than others, um, that would be one thing that it is. And uh, uh, I do mix and design my own glazes. And so this piece actually has three separate glazes that were fired one over the other over the other. And what makes this particular piece interesting is that each glaze is different and each glaze I design to actually need a component from the other glaze. And so when they're fired one over the other over the other, they have a tendency to want to go to the other glaze to get something that it needs to become complete. And so it makes a random organic design. Another thing a person can do with clay is they can roll it out into a flat slab and they can cut it and they could put together square pieces. This particular piece has got uh, just a simple design that I etched in here. This is kind of a Frank Lloyd Wright type of uh, appearance with this right here and um, these square corners. So this is kind of a mission style and uh, it kind of has a, an arts and crafts flair to it, which is something I also enjoy. This piece here has just a simple wooden lid. Again, I like to have this organic curve here. I like these pieces to have a very natural and organic appearance about them. And this is just a little piece of wood that has a stem that I fastened on there. You can also go with a piece here. This is a tile, a simple ceramic tile, and I impressed a dragonfly image deep into the clay when it's wet, and to give it that dark, kind of a fossil type impression, I take some iron and water, and I paint that down inside there before the tile is fired, and when it's fired, 
that iron that's in with the water combines with the clay and actually is burned down into the clay to give it that dark kind of a natural organic fossil type of an impression. And then I just cut this wood frame out here and uh, give it a little stilt in the back and uh, so this piece here can just sit by itself. Now as far as bigger things goes, here's a lamp. It has a ceramic base and uh, I put the dragonfly decoration that's in imprinted in there like a fossil. A little bit of iron in there to darken it up. And this glaze that I use is actually an ash glaze. So I take wood, uh, I burn it, and from the ashes, then I mix that with a couple other things. And so this glaze is comprised primarily of wood ash, which again, has a very random appearance. It always looks different depending on how thick it is and what it's on and the temperature we fire it at. Again, I, th I try to get an arts and crafts shape on here and uh, something that uh, Stickley or, uh, or Frank Lloyd Wright would, uh, would like. And uh, for, a, for a top, we have a mica shade that we craft and uh, these pieces of mica are cut by hand and uh, put onto a, a very light metal frame to hold them. And uh, this has a somewhat of a unique fixture design that I came up with that is all copper. So this is ceramic and copper and mica. And I, those are three materials that I really enjoy and I think they, uh, they kind of seem natural and go together. All of these pieces really are inspired by what is called the Arts and Crafts Movement. And the Arts and Crafts Movement is a time frame from about 1895 to uh, I think the beginning of World War I, which would have been about 1915-16. Uh, and uh, there are several prominent characters back in that time uh, that were part of the Arts and Crafts Movement. Gustav Stickley and his craftsmen uh, would be a prime example of that, or Albert Hubbard. Um, there's a few individuals. And Frank Lloyd Wright, to some degree, this shade here is really part of what is called the prairie home uh, style that Frank Lloyd Wright had, very low profile. The arts and crafts movement is what I keep in mind all the time. So everything that I do kind of has, a, kind of has an arts and crafts uh, look about it and or an organic appearance to it. The arts and crafts style is as much about shape and color, it's about a way of thinking, it's about a form of simplicity. And so everything here is designed really with simplicity in mind and a natural appearance to it. Again, these pieces here try to uh, draw some inspiration from the arts and crafts movement, which is a time when people were thinking that our machines and our factories and our automation were depriving people of the ability to be creative. And so the arts and crafts movement was the idea of bringing back some art into your craft. And so even the blacksmith back then was seen as creating art through his craft. So the arts and crafts movement is the idea of of uh, giving people the satisfaction of uh, bringing back creativity into their actual work. So all three of these pieces here are really uh, all very different from each other, but yet they're all similar in the fact that they're organic in their shape, they're natural in the impression that they give, and, uh, and they're simple in their design. Well, with that said, let's go through the process of making a bowl just like this. And so we'll head off to the potter's wheel now and uh, you can see how it's done. Yeah, I've been working with clay here for, well, let's see, it's about 12 years now, and every time I sit down at this wheel, I still feel like a beginner, but I enjoy it, and I, maybe that's why I do enjoy it, because I think, like a lot of things, once you feel like you've mastered it or have it well under hand, for some reason, you seem to lose a little bit of the fun when that happens, so. And that's why I'm always trying to do something new and something different to kind of keep that sense of uh, inexperience. The first thing we're going to do is get a piece of clay. Uh, this clay I've already worked with a bit, but to get it uh, in a nice working condition, I'm going to, this is called wedging it. And when I twist it a little bit at the bottom, it's kind of working any air that might be in there out the top. Clay is actually made up of silica, which we call quartz, 
and 60% of the Earth's surface is actually made out of uh, is actually made out of quartz. So clay is uh, there's nothing as natural or as abundant as clay. So, and what I'm doing in this twisting action is actually getting those clay crystals to actually start themselves into a circular motion, which will help me a little bit when I uh, start start the wheel up. So now I'm going to make this into a round ball. Uh, this is a very simple potter's wheel. It's uh, uh, it's electric and it has a variable speed foot pedal. And uh, some people, when they're working on a wheel, uh, have it spin really fast. I have a tendency to like a uh, slower spinning wheel, so we'll start this off spinning. And I'm going to put a little bit of water. When I drop that clay down in the middle, it's going to stick there. So the first task I have is to get that clay to be centered in the wheel. And so I'm going to speed it up a little bit, and I'm going to put a little pressure on the side and a little pressure on the top at the same time. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm kind of making it wide and kind of flat. Then I'm going to use this hand right here to bring it in and then up a little bit. And what I'm doing is getting the clay used to uh, the circular motions that I'm going to be using when I start in earnest. And I'm always adding a little bit of water because I need to keep that uh, uh, sense of it being able to slip. So I've got it pretty well centered now. So what I usually do is just use my finger to kind of clean up the base. And now I'm going to take this thumb and I'm going to just start to drive it down a little bit in the middle on top. And uh, I want it to be right in the center, so I don't want my thumb to be moving around at all. It needs to be staying very solid so that this is in the center. And once I get that down in, then I'll take my other thumb and I'll kind of make it a little bit wider. And then I'm going to go all the way down. Now once I get down, I'm going to use this finger here and I'm going to use this hand bracing the outside and I'm going to use this finger to actually create what's going to be the bottom on this item by going like this with, uh, with my finger. And so I'm going to speed it up a little bit. And in creating the bottom, I'm forcing some of this clay to go up. And now that I've got the bottom made, I have a pretty thick side here. And we're going to start drawing that out. And as we start drawing that out, we're going to take this clay, and it's going to become thinner and thinner and thinner as I begin to draw that out a little bit. And then I'm going to come up. Can't move it too fast. Uh, I find that if you're in a hurry, you usually regret it in the long run. Now I've got some extra material at the top here that I'm going to take off because I'm going to, I, I don't need it. So there's always a little bit of clay that's going to be coming up and then it's going to get cut off. And so I'm continuing to bring out the base here. I want to create a nice rounded organic type shape. And so I'm going to keep doing that and then I'll go up. I'll use different parts of my hands and fingers uh, to do different things and to guide on the outside um, I, I have a tendency to use this part of my hand uh, against the outside and then my finger or both of my fingers will be on the inside creating pressure and that pressure is what's going to draw the clay out more and then I'm just encouraging it out more and more and more and so I'm using my knuckle right now on the outside uh, to smooth keeping it wet. Now, I'm going to switch over. Instead of using my hand now, I'm going to use a tool here that I've got that I've always enjoyed. It's uh, somewhat flexible and it's made out of a plastic. It's got one flat side and it's got a nice curved side. And I find that I really enjoy this curved part here. And so to give this a uh, more finished look, I'm going to use a little piece of uh, very flexible metal on the outside and this is going to become my new fingers on the inside. So uh, to get this roughed up, I used my hands, but now to finish it, I'm going to exchange my fingers for these two tools. 
And uh, so I'm going to put that tool on the inside. And then as soon as I use this, uh, as soon as I use this um, thin piece of metal, you'll notice it starts to look a little more refined. I do this because I, I like to relax and I like to enjoy it and I don't find myself in any kind of a hurry. So I have a tendency to run the speed a little bit slower. I work with clay that's a little stiffer than most because I want to come out a lot at the base. And so for that clay to be able to hold itself up without just flopping down, I have to have a little bit stiffer clay. So, And so now I'm just going to use these two tools and I'm going to go start at the bottom, giving a little bit of pressure. So you'll see it's starting to take shape, getting a kind of an organic curve there at the bottom that I like. And it's going to gradually get bigger and bigger. Now I'm going to stop and check the thickness of this, so I just stop it, I reach in and uh, gauge how thick it is in general. And uh, so I, I, it's plenty thick now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw this out some more. Now I like each one to be a little bit different, but they're somewhat similar in their in the impression that they give, but no two pieces do I try to measure. For example, I don't measure this to make sure it's a certain size, and I don't measure this to make sure it's a certain size. I just go until it, uh, until, until it feels good. I like to have a low profile, so I don't come up too high. Uh, I like to kind of have it be rounded. I'd like this piece to kind of give the impression if you were to walk through the woods and find it just sitting on the ground that you might think it just kind of grew there. And uh, so we're getting very close right there. Now that's the general idea. Now this uh, inward lip here <coughs> is, uh, is a little bit rough because I don't work with that, but that we're going to clean up a little bit later. So for right now, we're just going to clean up the bat that it sits on. I find that sometimes I'll do a piece and I'll take it off and I'll have it sit on a shelf and uh, I'll go, uh, you know, and look at it again a couple hours later. And oftentimes I'll put it back on the wheel and do a little more work with it. And I think that is something I've never heard or seen any other potter ever put anything back on after they were done. But I always set it aside and I look at it. Now I'm going to use this flat part of this tool on the floor, on the inside of the bowl, to make sure that it's flat, make sure that it's consistent, because if this was to be cut and you saw a cross section, I want that floor and the wall to be the same thickness. Here is a bowl that was done about 24 hours ago, and it looks the same shape and size as the one we just worked on, but this one's a little drier, so I can show you that we, what we would do next with this. Um, this piece here, uh, the next thing I would normally do is clean up this outer, this uh, lip right here. And I would do that just by holding a tool and spinning it. And it's still wet enough where it is sticking to this bat, but it lets me then get this uh, rounded properly. Because if we're going to put a wood lid down in here, it's got to be rounded. So I just sc literally scrape so that this gets fixed and then uh, do a little bit at the top. And if we look down inside here, you can see the shavings that, uh, that we've uh, made by cleaning up this lip. And those shavings are uh, just cast off. This one here is dry enough now where this will come off. What we're gonna do now is clean up this base because you can see it's kind of rough right here and uh, my fingers and tools cannot get inside this extreme curve that I like. And so I put this on now and uh, we'll clean up the bottom. This has got to sit on here and turn, but since it's kind of dry, I take this little disc of wet clay that I keep handy and I put this down on here. And this is still kind of wet, but it's dry enough where I can work with it. And so I'll put this on here and press it down into there a little bit and I'm gonna use a tool 
and I just spin slowly, give it a little bit of pressure, and I'm just kind of cleaning and refining this edge. I always date things, and so we'll put in a date, signing name. I sign Al Clay. My name is Al, and this is Clay, so that's why I sign it Al Clay. Well, we do our firing in a different building other than a house because these kilns will give off a lot of, uh, well, very, very irritating fumes. In the case of this first firing, it's, ca it's called a bisque fire. A bisque fire is where we take this dry clay and we turn it into a ceramic material. That ceramic material, after it's heated up, to a certain degree actually changes from being clay and it becomes a different material and that's a ceramic material. Here is a sample of the ceramic material after the, after the first firing and you can hear that it has a kind of a dull, dull glass sound and right now it's hard. Well we're going to move on to the next building. This is where we'll do our glazing and also make our wood lit. So, this is the final building for the final two stages. The first part in the glazing process is to put some wax on the bottom of these bisque fired pieces so that when I glaze this, I won't get any glazing on the bottom because when it sits in the kiln, if there's glazing on the bottom, it would stick to the kiln shelf. So I've just got uh, a very simple uh, wax here that I put that I'm just going to apply right to the bottom here. I like to get a little bit away from the actual rim of the base so that I don't have that. So I'll do that to all three of these and then from there we'll go over and do the glazing. And now that we've got wax on the bottom of these three we're going to start in on the glazing process. I actually formulate my own glazes, which I find entertaining and fascinating because there's a lot of science involved and I enjoy that aspect of it. So I create and design my own glazes. You can see the water settles out from the, the clay body. So I'm just going to give this a real quick mix and then Now there's several ways that you can put glaze on a piece. You can brush it on, you can use an airbrush, you could spray it on. I dip my glazes simply um, because I like the effect it gives and uh, as part of the random organic design that I'm looking for, I don't want the glaze to be exactly even all the way around so I do that. And so I've got this uh, special tool here which helps me hold it and I'm just going to dip this whole piece down into the glaze and bring it up and you'll notice where I put the wax on the bottom it's running off and if I hadn't I'd have to clean that all off by hand which would be time consuming so the wax really helps a lot. Now what I'm doing is just kind of giving it a little bit of a shake as I turn it because I'm draining excess glaze out of the inside and I like to have some buildup on the rim because it's that buildup on the rim that gives me some of the uh, random effects that I look for. And later on, I'll take a cloth and wipe those little beads off there. And so this will take about 24 hours to really dry, and then it'll go back in the kiln. It'll be heated up to a higher temperature because we want to take this glaze, which is a glass, and we want to fuse it onto the ceramic material, which is the bowl. The reason I like to have those heavy drips is because I like to have this random pattern forming on the glaze when different glazes overlap each other. I like that, that random organic appearance. What these three pieces will get now will get wood lids, just like these three back here. And these three pieces also have been fired three times. The difference between this and this is this brown is got by adding some iron into the third glaze. Um, 
and this one here did not have any iron added into the third glaze. It actually had a little bit of copper, so it moves it to the, to the green. So these are really very similar, but one is using some iron at the end and one is using some copper at the end. So the iron gives me brown and the copper is giving me some green. And so what I will be doing now is with these three, I will be making wood lids just like these here. And so each wood lid is made and cut to fit only the piece that it's made for because each one of these openings is always going to be a little bit different. It's fun. I, I have nothing but fun. And these pieces, uh, they really are, uh, they're sold and sent all over the country. Not, uh, not in great numbers, but enough that I enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for common ground pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. To view this episode or any common ground segment, visit us at lptv.org backslash common ground. individual segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.